We have learned now how Dorian Hawkmoon, last Duke of Colm, threw off the power of the Black Jewel and saved the city of Hamadan from conquest by the Dark Empire of Grand Britain. His archenemy, Baron Melidus, defeated, Hawkmoon set off westward again, bound for the besieged Camargue, where his betrothed, Yzelda, Count Brass's daughter, awaited him. With his boon companion, Oladan, beastman of the Bulgar Mountains, Hawkman rode from Persia towards the Cyprian Sea and the port of Tarabulus, where they hoped to find a ship brave enough to bear them back to the Camargue. But in the Cyrenian desert they lost their way and came close to dying of thirst and exhaustion before they saw the peaceful ruins of Soriandum lying at the foot of a range of green hills on which wild sheep grazed. Meanwhile, in Europe, the Dark Empire extended its terrible rule, while elsewhere the rune staff pulsed, exerting its influence over thousands of miles to involve the destinies of some several human souls of disparate character and ambitions. Welcome, friends, to Breakfast in the Ruins, a Michael Moorcock flavoured podcast. Once again, we're reaching across the world, and Yorkshire meets California again, as friend of the show Dave, aka Sonus, returns to Derry and Tom's, this time to look at the first part of the second novel in the History of the Rune Staff series, The Tale of Hawkmoon, one of the big four eternal champions, and that book is The Mad God's Amulet. Now, I normally enter into something of a preamble here, but as this is the fourth Hawkmoon episode, and the episode lengths have been creeping upwards, I'm just going to keep it brief and call out a couple of things. First, Jade Design once again came through recently with the absolutely stupendous Jim Cawthorn art book, James Cawthorn, The Man and His Art, by his sister, Maureen. It's brilliant. It's got a metric ton of his art in there, including some Mocock character sketches that were never used elsewhere, well worth picking up by enthusiasts, I spent hours poring over it. Meanwhile, our subscriber count on YouTube continues to tick upwards, but it is nice to know that we reach people there too, as well as via the usual podcatchers, and we've had some quite recent comments as well. On our episode My Experiences in the Third World War, Christopher Robinson said, I've really been struggling with a flashback of all the nuclear fears I'd forgotten about long ago. I mean, as a kid, it sucked to learning I could burn alive at any moment, but by the time I graduated high school, it was over, and we went on to have a good life. And now, a half a century old, here we are again. Where's my Elric book collection? Looks like I'm going to need it again. Well, entirely relatable, Chris, and uh, get those Elric books back, and get reading. Meanwhile, Green Glassful commented on the final program Phase 1 episode from a couple of years ago, and said... Gave up on Mocock when he displayed himself a long time ago as a very typical leftist dork. Some great moments, however. Bit of a head-scratcher, but thanks for that one, Green Glassful. I think to a lot of people, his political leanings are part of the appeal, but we have also found, particularly from, for example, conversations with our good friend Jason, the pastor, that Mocock's appeal does cross political spectrums. So just reading that did inspire me to think again. It's round about time we did an episode on the politics of Moorcock, so look out for that at some point in the future. And Chris Grove commented on our Halloween 2020 episode on The Rats by James Herbert, and he said, I was a huge fan of the Canadian film Deadly Eyes in 1982, directed by Robert Klaus, and had to read the novel that it was based on. And I got to say it, James Herbert is the British Stephen King. Stephen King loves this guy, by the way, extremely good writer. He's able to really capture sexual explicitness along with what it's like to be beaten alive by rats in all its glory. As an American who lives in Reno, Nevada, where the only rats that exist are squirrels and muskrats, I've got to say, I love this shit, and rats freak the hell out of me, especially dog-sized ones, but I respect them because they're survivors. But obviously, you're both British, and I totally dig your take on this. Great synopsis. Thanks for that, Chris. And we did actually talk about the Robert Klaus film as a patron extra 
at some point we might just append that and stick it on the end of the uh, the actual rats episode but we'll see something for the future timothy lang on our night of sword book one episode said cheers thanks for your reading and laughing as you do our pleasure tim we do enjoy doing it thanks for listening and laughing along with us that's it for the youtube comments for today but please do keep them coming even the head scratchers we love to read them and if you are on a podcatcher that perhaps allows reviews, then please do feel free to drop us one, because we'd love to read it. Okay, Derry and Tom's awaits. So get into those loom pants and join Dave and I as we set out to visit Europe in the tragic millennium and check out The Mad God's Amulet, book one. <laughs> Dev, welcome back to Derry and Tom's. Great to have you back. And it doesn't seem like five minutes since you were on. And actually, right. it's not that long since you were on because it was only a couple of episodes ago. But welcome back. Great to be back. Happy to be here. This is uh, this is quite a, a short notice appointment as well because I only dropped you a line <laughs> yesterday and see if you were uh, to see if you had some spare time and you were available to, to record. So, so thanks Absolutely. for hopping into the hot seat. So no how problem. is Usurper of the Universe going? Uh, it's going pretty well. I mean, uh, yeah, wow. It was, I mean, I think the coolest thing that happened with that was, I mean, getting voted into number eight in the Doom charts in February. I mean, that was nice. mind blowing. I didn't expect that. Um, for anybody not familiar with Doom charts, it's this like international um, collection of music journalists and uh, reviewers and podcasters and DJs and like the underground kind of heavy rock scene. And they all get together every month and vote on like the best albums. So I got to number eight. That's nice. pretty crazy. February was a good month. Um, <laughs> so that was awesome. Uh, yeah, we got CDs. We got cassettes for sale at sonusrocks.bandcamp.com and, of course, uh, forbiddenplacerecords.bandcamp.com, and they have uh, much more of a stock. My, my stock is starting to run low, so if you want to get it from me, I personally i am shipping it to the U.S. and the U.K. now, um, and I'll sign it and write a nice little thank you note because I truly appreciate anybody spending their money especially these days mm. on um you know my music that's uh that that definitely means a lot it's a tough times out there um <laughs> and if you do boy let me tell you you were helping me out <laughs> mm. and of course what we should say for people who might be dropping into this podcast for the first time check out two podcasts ago because we talked at length about your first and second albums and of course dave aka sonus is on Bandcamp, is on Twitter, uh, is on Instagram. So check him out, and also check out that episode for a little bit more information about uh, about all these bits and pieces and the cracking two albums that he's knocked out. But I have noticed since he dropped on Twitter and started up your Twitter account that it's getting loads of interest. Yeah, you know, I was really resting to join Twitter because I, you know, it's definitely one of those things that's totally contributing to the uh, end of all mankind. But you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. what can I say? It's gotten me a few t-shirt sales and CDs, so it can't be all bad, right? <laughs> that's how those things go. Yeah, I, oh, I find man. Twitter is is the one where you have to spend the most time curating your feed, unless you want to go absolutely nuts. Uh, so yeah. it does it does take a little bit of uh, mental energy to to yeah. block out all the uh, all the bad <laughs> stuff. But you know, on the whole. It's a good community, and uh, yeah. you know your gear and my gear is crossing over into a similar community as well. So that's nice. Yeah, it's awesome, and yeah, it's it's been really cool. I mean, I've uh, you know quote unquote met uh, <laughs> quite a few really nice, cool people in there. So yeah, yeah it's been a, overall a very positive experience that I was not anticipating it to be. And mm. thankfully, you know, I've uh, done my best to somehow be able to avoid uh, too many crazy. <laughs> wacky political posts and stuff like that so yeah. there you go <laughs> yeah I'm, all, all that will come with time oh i'm sure <laughs> yeah. but we are here and we decided very very quickly yesterday what could we cover today and we decided and it just so happened that you were just reading mad god's amulet that's and right since uh, Tash is still punishing me by refusing to move on and do Mad God's Amulet until I've treated her to several steaks and a whole lot of rum, because uh, she's she's got to the point where she thinks that I only value her for content. <laughs> 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 so so I'm having to work on Tash a little bit, and I think uh, we've actually got lined up uh, Nine Princes in Amber 
for oh, our man. Uh, for our next pickup with uh, with Tash. So Hawkman was left needing a ringer, and uh, it, Mad God's Amulet was a perfect pickup. So we're here to do book one of the Mad God's Amulet, which is great because I've been meaning to crack onto it for ages, and I think people will probably have picked up from when we've discussed uh, Julian's skull. That I think there is something of a quality dip as you progress through the Heart Moon books, and then the quality comes right back up again towards the end. But this is based upon twenty-year-old memories, so I'm really, really excited to get back into this. Yeah. First up, what what edition are you working from? So I'm working off of the Mayflower with this wonderful. I believe this is the Bob Haberfield uh, cover mm-hmm. um, with this frowning demon thing over yep. this castle that is also a man's face i love bob haberfield's covers i think every single one of them would be a freaking amazing album cover if yes. anybody knows bob haberfield's estate and could uh, get me in touch with them somehow i would like to make that happen uh i don't mm. think that anything like that is uh, currently going on and it would really be a shame for this guy's awesome art to just kind of you know die out there in uh, oh god there is such bookshops. a catalog of his there must be a an incredible catalog of his work somewhere or is oh, it yeah. owned by his estate that is just ripe ripe for heavy metal plunder for real i mean mm. the whole heavy psych scene would just lose their collective shit over it i mean i do every time i find one of those i'm like oh, i gotta get the haberfield cover yeah because it's just so cool look at that i don't care if it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the book maybe maybe not depends on you know how much acid you're on when you're reading it at the time perhaps but uh they are visually striking gotta give them that i like to think that that is probably one of the covers that he did that relates most clearly yeah. to the contents <laughs> Because uh, some of them really, really are way out there. But oh, yeah. Yeah, maybe maybe that is the Mad God in his castle in Ukraine. I don't know. Could Who be. knows? We're going to have to read I, on and find out. I have we? not gotten to that part yet. So mm. I'm going, listeners, I'm going into this book completely fresh, hot off the heels of finishing The Jewel in the Skull. And um, I'm sure we will... we will certainly have thoughts on, as Andy mentioned, a certain dip in quality. <laughs> <laughs> which I yeah. uh, have to say I'm agreeing with, which is probably why I have not finished it yet. I think I started this book uh, maybe two months ago, and it's not long, people. Mm. As Morcott goes, it is not a long book, but it has just taken me a long time to kind of muster up the uh, <laughs> the willingness to press on, yeah. which is strange, too, because as we'll find out, book one is jam-packed with action. So oh, much yeah. stuff happens. It doesn't rest for a second. It is never boring, but... no. Whatever reason, I found it a little hard to kind of get through this one. Mm. It is full of incident, book one. Oh, yeah. I, from memory, and again, I'm going back a long way, from memory, this is one of the series where it becomes something of a travelogue in, it, in books two and three. And my memories of Sword of the Dawn are dim. And mm-hmm. I think the reasons that they're dim is because I didn't think too much of it at the time. But yeah. I'm really excited about revisiting it. So, yeah. let's go for it. I'm reading okay. from... Uh, this is one of Pop's hand-me-downs from back in the day. This is the Book Club Associates History of the Rune Staff wow. uh, omnibus in hardcover. The dust cover is around here somewhere, and it's that pale yellow cover with the rune staff and the snake. I like sort of think, kind of like a snake turning into a strangely shaped staff and uh, a golden figure. In the background, huh. but that's that's not kicking around. So this was um, book club associates was uh, a club, a book club. Weirdly enough, from the title, that was around in the seventies and eighties in the UK, and my folks had a subscription to it, and I don't know if pops did or whether he just found it at a market or whatever. But my main memories of book club associates is there would always be a Jilly Cooper novels, which were racy horse racing novels or there would be uh james clavel novels i can remember my dad reading shogun in a book club associates edition so book club associates was like a a really mysterious thing to me as a child where you never really knew what was going to turn up and probably my favorite memory of a bca book landing was i think it was called black camelot and it was by oh god i forgot the name of the author but it was about witchcraft in a castle in world war ii germany being Whoa. run by the SS or the Gestapo or somebody, and, and, and Himmler's obsession with the occult. And it had this really wow. wonderful cover, 
of an SS officer falling screaming from a burning castle tower that <laughs> seared into my memory. Yeah. So, unfortunately, my mum and dad never got any Mocock through Book Club Associates. No idea why. It's a shame, though. But Black but, Camelot, they got you yeah. that, though. That sounds awesome. That sounds incredible. That is metal as hell. <laughs> and I, I, it's, a, it's a real shame I don't have it anymore. And it's also doubly annoying that I can't remember the name of the author. But I'm sure someone will pop up and tell us in the comments with any luck. Anyway, that's my edition of The Mad God's Amulet for today. So I've got my, got my Breakfast in the Ruins bookmark well positioned in the wrong place, I might add. <laughs> there we go. I think we should probably just do a quick recap of The Jewel in the Skull shouldn't we? Sure. The main setup of the Jewel in the Skull is Count Brass, the tall, seasoned warrior who controls the Camargue, is visited by Baron Meliodas of Grand Bretagne, who seems like quite a swish, stylish, beautifully bearded and quaffed nobleman, but he turns out to be a right rotter. And what he's trying to do is get Count Brass to side with this dark empire of Grand Bretagne. And of course, in this version of Europe, and we'll talk about this version of Europe a little bit later, but in this version of Europe, the British Isles are the villains. So the Empire of Grand Bretagne, they all wear masks, they all hate to be seen, they're all, how would you describe a Grand Bretannian? Perverted, do some word association, perverted, degenerate. evil, <laughs> degenerate, yeah. yeah. And they have numerous different orders, all of whom adopt uh, a beast icon and have beast masks. We find out a little bit later on that Meliodas has designs on Count Brass's daughter, Yzelda. Brass rebuffs him. He heads back to Londra with his tail between his legs, at which point Hawkmoon, the hero of the tale, is brought in chains to Londra. And Hawkmoon is essentially a PTSD mess of trauma at that point. His father was killed, his entire city was sacked, he then later became a mercenary captain for the Grand Britannians in order to to position himself to take revenge. That didn't go quite according to plan. His army got wiped out, taken in chains to Londra, and they decide to use him as a weapon. So he's taken to Tarragon's Palace of Time. Tarragon, interesting character, wears a clock as a mask into all his weird signs and sorcery machines. They implant the Black Jewel in his head, which is... Uh, in some ways, a piece of ancient technology, but in other ways, a, pe- a fairly lame piece of technology because it's basically a black and white camera. <laughs> with no, no audio. <laughs> with no sound, <laughs> yeah. which he uses to his advantage for, uh, later on. And then they send him to the Camargue. Fortunately, Yzelda, being a really hot babe, manages to get through to him. And with the help of Burr Gentle, Count Brass's warrior poet mate, they managed to get through to him, use kind of sorcerous poem spells? Sort of? I suppose so. Yeah. Like rhythmic, um, God, yeah. Beat poetry, death jam, yeah. uh, dispelling. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Sonic, bonic, bullshit poems. Yeah. Um, to, to shut down the, the duel, and he's not, it, it may well activate at any time. But then he must go on a quest. You've just read it, Dave. Why does he go to Hamadan in book three? So he goes to Hamadan to seek out... Good Lord, give me a second. <laughs> yeah. Why does he go to Hamadan in book three? So he, much goes on. So the Kamak the Kama goes under siege, doesn't it? And then yeah. he leads uh, a series of, like a guerrilla campaign, and yeah. has a number of battles with Meliodas. Oh, shit. I forgot why he goes to Hamadan. But anyway, you know. <laughs> let's just say he goes on a quest. He goes on a quest for, you know, murky reasons, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He, he goes on a quest, ends up in Hamadan, where the Queen of Hamadan is at war with the uh, Grand Britannians herself. There's all sorts of shenanigans going on. He's fallen in with his mate, Oladan, who saved him. Oladan is like Diddy Chewbacca. Yes. Yeah. Is is a fairy bloke with a bow. Yeah, he's the offspring of a sorcerer and a mountain giantess who somehow is really, really short, and that's got to be really frustrating. 
Yeah. And <laughs> but fortunately for Hartman, rather than going, he actually speaks English. So that's quite handy. So it's like a Diddy Chewbacca who speaks English and he becomes Hartman's mate. They end up in Hamadan. They help the Queen of Hamadan defeat the Grand Britannians. And because for, he's basically a bloke and the hero of the tale, the Queen of Hamadan has got the hots for him, but he's like, no, sorry, babe. I've I've got a job to do, and he shuts <laughs> her down. But we'll find out shortly that she did give him some rather nice presents. When yes, he and I yeah. remember why they went to Hamadan because they're looking for this this guy, this sorcerer who is um, affiliated with the Rune Staff, and he's the only one who can yes. take the jewel out of Hawk Moon's head. Of course, that's yeah. it. Yeah. And I forget so, his name. <laughs> yeah, well, he's old news now, isn't he? Yeah, he's only in there for a, like a chapter or something. Yeah. He doesn't help him because, uh, you know, the Grand Britannians are there. And he's like, well, okay, maybe if you defeat the Grand Britannians. And then Hawkman's like, oh, well, I guess I really got to defeat the Grand Britannians now. So he does. Yeah. And Malagigi. then he gets help. Malagigi, that was it. That was Malagigi. the one. Malagigi, yeah. So the end of Jewel in the Skull, it says, uh, Queen Farabra herself escorted them to the gates of Hamadan the next morning. You'll not think again, Dorian Hawkmoon. I offer you a throne, the throne my brother died trying to win. Hawkmoon looked to the west. Two thousand miles and several months' journey away, Yzelda awaited him. Knowing whether he had succeeded in his goal, I was now a victim of the Black Jewel. Count Brass too waited and must be told of Grand Britain's further infamy. Beau Gentle, doubtless, was even now standing with Yzelda in the turret of the topmost tower of Castle Brass, looking over the wild fenland of the Camargue trying to console the girl who wondered if the man pledged to wed her would ever return. He bowed in his saddle and kissed the Queen's hand. I thank you, Your Majesty, and I am honoured that you would think me worthy to rule with you, but there is a pledge I must keep, that I would forfeit twenty thrones to keep, and I must go. Also, my blade is needed against the Dark Empire. Then go, she said sadly, but remember Hamadan and her Queen. I will. He urged his great blue-coated stallion out across the rocky plain. Behind him, Oladan turned, blew a kiss to Queen Frobra, winked, and rode after his friend. Dorian Hawkmoon, Duke von Colm, rode steadily westward to claim his love and take his vengeance. So, we pick up the Mad God's Amulet with Chapter 1. And it didn't go quite well, their, uh, their, their adventure off, because they get lost. <laughs> Pretty much yeah. straight away. <laughs> Come close to dying of thirst and exhaustion. Yeah. Yeah. Which which is it's kind of like a Conan story starting that, isn't it? Conan Honestly, regularly starts stories like that. And going back to Conan, doesn't the end of uh doesn't the end of Jewel in the Skull almost seem a bit like the end of Conan the Destroyer? Maybe they took it from there. <laughs> another mm. another uncredited Morcock pilfering. <laughs> Yeah, very possibly. Well, of course, I think I think Could Roy be. Thomas had quite a hand in Conan the Destroyer, yeah, and, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Mm. So and John Milius wrote Conway. the first one. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and, and yeah Roy, Roy Thomas and yeah, Jerry Conway. Yeah. Um, did, yeah. And they were, of course, probably adapting lots and lots of Moorcock at the time. No, they, probably. Roy Thomas did do Moorcock adaptations, didn't he? I mean, I'm pretty sure he's the one who uh, wrote the crossover with Ulrich. In the yes, Conan he did. comics, he did. So sure. I, he at least was aware of Morcock. Yeah, yeah. But they got lost. They're pretty close to dying of thirst. They're caked with dust and everything else. And it kicks off with a a succinct but quite flavorful description of the city of Soriandum. It says, "The city was old, begrimed by time, a place of wind-worn stones and tumbled masonry." its towers tilting and its walls crumbling. Wild sheep cropped the grass that grew between cracked paving stones. Bright plumed birds nested among columns of faded mosaic. The city had once been splendid and terrible. Now it was beautiful and tranquil. The two travellers came to it in the mellow haze of the morning, when a melancholy wind blew through the silence of the ancient streets. The hoofs of the horses were hushed as the travellers led them between towers that were green with age, passed by ruins bright with blossoms of orange, okra, and purple. And this was Soriandum, deserted by its folk. The men and the horses were turned all one colour by the dust that caked them, making them resemble statues that had come to life. They moved slowly, looking wonderingly about them at the beauty of the dead city. That's a really, really nice opening. 
it is I think it's something of a, a fantasy staple we've just mentioned Conan it's a good starting point for a story our heroes are at the lowest ebb they work their, they, they find themselves in a ruined city instantly mysterious where are the occupants if this was a Conan novel, the occupants would probably be degenerate cannibals <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. But this is a little bit more uh, interesting, I think, the uh, the sorry andam story. And it's the yeah. first of our pretty action-packed and interesting elements to this, uh, this, this book one. And then it's followed by quite a nice description of our heroes. It says, The first man was tall and lean, and although weary, he moved with the graceful stride of the trained warrior. His long fair hair had been bleached near white by the sun, and his pale blue eyes had a hint of madness in them. But the thing most remarkable about his appearance was the dull black jewel sunk into his forehead, just above and between the eyes. A stigmata he owed to the perverted miracle workings of the sorcerer scientists of Grand Bretagne. His name was Dorian Hawkman, Duke von Colm, driven from his hereditary lands by the conquests of the Dark Empire, which schemed to rule the world. Dorian Hawkman, who had sworn vengeance against the most powerful nation, on his war-tormented planet. The creature who followed Hawkman bore a large burn bow and a quiver of arrows on his back. He was clad only in a pair of breeches and boots of soft floppy leather, but the whole of his body, including his face, was covered in red wiry hair. His head came to just below Hawkman's shoulder. This was Oladan, crossbred offspring of a sorcerer and a mountain giantess from the Bulga Mountains. A little bit light, on the sartorial descriptions, but, you know, pretty good descriptions of both characters, and we do get some cracking descriptions of uh, of Hawkmoon Garb coming up very, very soon, which oh, uh, his I garb. thoroughly enjoyed when I read it. <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah, oh my God, if we get to that, yeah. um, it is just amazing to then picture him in that for quite a good chunk of the story. Yeah. Well, but we'll, we'll we'll get to that in a moment. But <laughs> I am definitely commissioning someone to do a heart moon sketch in that clobber. Got we'll to do it. We'll get to it in a sec. So <laughs> heart moon checks his map that he got from Hamadan and identifies their location as sorry, Andam, a long abandoned city near the Euphrates. And this is a quite a nice reminder that again, this is a world very very close to our own. And I'm thinking. Outside of Jerry Cornelius, obviously, which is like fairly contemporary in terms of setting, is this the only Michael Mocock character to occupy so close uh, an analog to our own world? I, I was thinking about it earlier on because Coram is kind of like in a a world very heavily influenced by ancient Cornish yeah. legends and myths, but I think this is the only one, isn't it? I think it must be, and um, that's always kind of the interesting thing. And uh, one of the uh, sort of, uh, I, I guess, almost uh, troubles I've had in terms of like imagining Hawkmoon's world because it's it takes place basically we find out um, nine hundred or some odd years after presumably a nuclear apocalypse. Mm. So you know, are we imagining a bunch of blown out buildings at this point? It doesn't seem like it. It seems more like society has sort of rebuilt itself into some kind of quasi medieval technology but obviously with the occasional super science that looks like mm. sorcery and and things like that so it's kind of you know it's kind of like okay how much of the modern world should we imagine when we're looking at this now from descriptions of uh, paris in the first book it's like a city made out of crystal and stuff so mm. obviously um either all the glass got melted into some kind of crazy crystalline city uh from a nuclear explosion or they just rebuilt all kinds of high fantasy craziness um so mm. it it kind of really gives you a lot of different avenues which you could kind of go down when imagining this world because you know that's kind of the beauty uh with moorcock is his descriptions are thus that you can kind of really imagine a lot with the words that he gives you and kind of however you really want to imagine them one of the things i really appreciate about this setting is that they're not digging up rifles. You know, yeah. They're, they're not digging up technology that we would understand. All of the ancient technology is always really, really weird. So this this ancient cataclysm that happened, there is you know, there are suggestions like with the wormwoods in, in, in the first book that, that they're they've been devastated by some kind of weapon that you could like maybe radiation could be an analogue. 
um, you know the the crazy twisted forests that are really really dangerous but I don't know things like baragoons you know weird mutated men I always got the sense that the cataclysm that happened to tragic millennium Europe was whilst you've got references to ancient gods like John Paul George and Ringo and <laughs> British pop culture and political figures from the time when he was writing these books he, I think he very much veers away from the conventional and that's what makes it so much more interesting a world and I think I yeah. might have mentioned on the Julian School episode that there was a, a, a role playing supplement that was done for the Hawkmoon role playing game um, set on the island of Ireland and the characters find tanks and helicopters and you have helicopter fights versus ornithopters and flamingos, which I think is <laughs> absolutely the worst possible interpretation of, of this. And it's all assault rifles and tanks. It's really, really terrible. Um, yeah. I, I, I like the weird science angle. I think oh, it's yeah. great. All, all the weapons of war always tend to be bell-shaped as well, I've noticed. That seems to be quite a frequent thing. We yeah. get, a bell, get a bell-shaped weapon later on, which comes in quite handy. <laughs> but anyway, let's get to... Uh, Hawkman. We've got to get to Hawkman's clobber. We have to. It must be said. <laughs> yeah, Oladan's decided that he's gonna. He's, he spotted a ram when they were on the way in, so he's gonna go and find some mutton so they can dine on mutton this evening. And it says, uh, Hawkman stripped off his clothes and plunged his hands into the cool spring water. Oh, cool spring water. Spring water. Spring water. Whatever. Gasping with a <laughs> sense of utter luxury as he poured the water over his head and body, then. He took fresh clothing from the saddlebag, pulling on a silk shirt given him by Queen Frobra of Hamadan and a pair of blue cotton breeches with flaring bottoms. That's right, people. Oh, <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> glad to be out of the heavier leather and iron he'd worn for the protection's sake whilst crossing the desert in case any of the Dark Empire's men were following them, Hartman donned a pair of sandals to complete his outfit. And so, doesn't it, though? <laughs> incredible. Is wearing a silk shirt, blue cotton wafters, and sandals. And this is how he spends the next couple of chapters, including <laughs> having scraps on stairs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> really, this is... It, it indicates two things. One is depictions of Hawkmoon, which actually are quite few and far between, yeah. outside of comics. Really, I've got a lot of work to do to catch up with this. Yep. And the other thing is... How fucking trendy was Hamadan? You never got a sense of that at the end of Julian the School, did you? That's right. I mean, you know, in fairness, I guess they were occupied. Maybe all your cool, you know, hippie clothing goes in favor of uh, battle dress at that time. But yeah, man, True. here you have Ockmoon walking around like I imagine some hippie on Portobello Road back in Moorcock's <laughs> time, you know, just with the sandals and his, you know, his flares and his silk shirt and his sun bleach blonde hair just waving around, just grooving. The yeah. only thing he's got on him is, you know, his sword, just in case. <laughs> yeah. His his mighty battle blade. That's yeah. right. I love yeah. it. And I love the idea that when Hamadan isn't at war with Grand Bretagne, actually it's got really trendy chapeau shops and haberdasheries <laughs> and and uh excellent tailors to produce all of this stuff. It's wonderful. Oh, so yeah. that, that that is now burned into my mind. And I was so pleased when I got Clint Langley and I commissioned him to do my third Elric when I said, can you do him how he's dressed at the beginning of the Dreaming City? And he knocked that out and it was wonderful. The downside to commissioning Clint to do this is he only really likes Elric. He's never really been a fan of any of the other Moorcock characters. But I am sorely tempted to drop him a line and say, can you do me a hawk moon in this, with this description? But, the world must see this side mm, of hawk moon. Yeah. So... He's well-dressed, he's refreshed, he has a nap, before he realises actually that Oladan hasn't returned. So he goes for a gallop about, but to no avail. There is uh, a nice, uh, again, another example of how lovely just little throwaway lines are and how evocative they are. It says, A head was a herd of wild sheep led by a large, wise-looking ram. Perhaps the one Oladan had mentioned, but there was no sign at all of the little beast man. I love that. And it's a silly little thing. But a head was a herd of wild sheep led by a large, wise-looking ram. That just leapt off the page yeah. at me as super, super evocative, and I can see it. I can yeah. see the scene. 
You so see the wind that. just blowing his his hair around and the, the yeah. dust, and he's just looking proudly. Looking horns. proud, looking wise. Yeah. He probably a looks at Hawk. Ram. Yeah, probably looks at Hawkman and judges him. That's right, yeah. you yeah. lowly creature. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't I like come. your shirt though. Yeah. Nice wafters. <laughs> Excellent wafters. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, he returns to Sariandum and, oh well, oh no, there's men there, there's an ornithopter, so there's trouble. Grand Britain have caught up with them. Chapter 2. And Chapter 2 is titled Huyam de Verk. Now, here we go into pronunciation corner. Is it de Ver or is it de Verk? You know, I personally, I, I land that hard C because it's there, but I, 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 I know nothing about the French language, so I apologize in advance. I I get that it's it's probably, you know, like like William, like their version of William, but yeah. that's that's about it. So yeah. We um they have very I sound like a barbarian saying it. Yeah. Let's just agree on Deverk. There you um, go. <laughs> because, you know, we are a pair of uh, non French speaking barbarians. So um, yeah. someone can put us right <laughs> if they want, but hell, it won't be the first time we mangled some language on this yeah. show. <laughs> Um, right, I'm just going to very quickly open a can of Dirty Booze. Because, of course, whilst it's um, only about half past midday for you in the sunshine of California, it's half past eight in the evening for me over here in grim, grim Bradford. So I'm just going just gonna to pour out a quick libation. And Go this for is, it. Uh, what is this? This is something Phil picked me up, and it is a pecan and toffee stout. Mm. Pecan and toffee, that sounds pretty damn good. Yeah. Everybody is going absolutely hell bent for leather when it comes to ridiculous stouts and porters over here at the moment. I don't know what it's like over your side of the world, but we have had some really, really unusual imperial stouts and porters. But this one's quite a gotcha. sensible one, uh, 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 a lowly seven percent. Um, so I'm hoping it will actually oh. be be palatable. Be nice yeah, if it is seven percent. Not too bad. Yeah, over on my side of the world, everybody is still, still. Still, they haven't gotten sick of it yet. They're still just crazy over IPAs. That's the big oh. thing in San Jose. It's just IPA, IPA, IPA. You go to like a place and they've got like 13 IPAs and people with, you know, beards and gauges and nose rings. They go, dude, this is a good IPA. And, you know, man, I mean, you know, to each their own, but I like it, uh, an IPA on occasion. It's all right, but mm. I, it's just too much all the time. It's just. God, it's strong. And I'm I'm drinking, personally right now, I'm drinking some green tea, which I've steeped for over an hour. Now, I like my tea very strong. Mm. Um, but IPAs are too strong and bitter, even for me, most mm. of the time. I am really, really bored of dry hopped IPAs. Yeah. They're just, they're just everywhere. Can they're we everywhere. just come with something else, for yeah. Christ's sake? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I've, I've got a little bit confused now between... East Coast IPAs, DIPAs. Um, I think one of the ones that Phil got me was an Indian pale, uh, an India pale lager, which just tasted like just tasted like a dry hopped IPA. Um, but I, I gotta imagine <laughs> it's not even an ale anymore. It's just a lager here. <laughs> yeah. Well, fortunately, the pecan and softest out is most agreeable, so that's good. Fantastic. So, Hartman sneaks back into town as the Ornithopter circles. And, of course, I've only ever seen Ornithopters in one other place, and that's in Dune, isn't it? Yeah. But at the end of the end of Chapter 1, we do get a really nice um, description of the Ornithopter. It says, The thing descending from the sky was unmistakably an ornate Ornithopter, wrought in the shape of a gigantic condor, enameled in blue, scarlet, and green. Yeah. Certainly not a Dune Ornithopter. That's pretty awesome. That's a great description. Maybe, maybe more like a David Lynch Dune kind of Ornithopter. <laughs> Yeah, a bit it's more just, fitting into that style, I guess. Yeah, it's such a shame. Yeah. Lynch in the early eighties couldn't do something a little bit more interesting with the ornithopt uh, concepts that he was able to do with, with kind of what he had to hand. But I was yeah. thinking about that, and you know, the, the representations of ornithopters that we've had in on covers and in comics and things like that. And I've got to say, I've got to say, hats off to Neil Burton. I think the illustration of the ornithopter he did for Volume One of the of the Journal, that colourful action shot of the of the condor like ornithopter firing yeah. flame cannons, I think is probably my favourite representation of an ornithopter that I've seen as an illustration. Yeah, good job. That one and um James Cawthorn's art on yes. I, I, I have volume two of uh, his 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 Hawkmoon uh works. I, I also I ordered volume one. It didn't 
still hasn't come in yet. Um, but I got to say, the fact that he was roommates with Morcock at the time, is, is, it's pretty cool to see kind of his takes on things and knowing that Morcock saw them, obviously liked them. And um, I think he did a fancy – oh, there we go. There it is right there. Yeah, I really like the way that he drew um, the ornithopters in, yeah. in his adaptations because – and, and actually all the cities, not only is it just phenomenal – artwork but i mean i think it's just a really perfect representation of this of this world and just like how i guess humanity's built back after the apocalypse and stuff like that and what a weird twisted world it is yeah i, I do like his illustrations of the ornithopsis but there's there's still something the, 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 they're described in the books as having clanking wings as if the wings are like massive clashing metal things whereas I think the holes of his ornithopters look great, but I'm I'm not convinced yeah. by like the the wings with the um, yeah the fair rigging. enough yeah the, yeah the rigging. But anyway, a slight diversion there. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a book is now upside down. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, the the idea of the beautiful but deadly ornithopter is is a really really vivid image. It's great. It lands. A vulture mass pilot is joined on the ground by some others. Ooh, well, who could there be? These men were evidently of Grand Britain also. They were all clad in heavy armour and cloaks, with huge metal masks covering their heads in spite of the heat. Such was the twisted nature of Dark Empire men that they could not rid themselves of their masks whatever the circumstances. They seemed to have a deep-rooted psychological reliance on them. The masks were of rust red and murky yellow, fashioned to resemble rampant wild boars with fierce jewelled eyes that blazed in the sunlight and grey ivory tusks curling from their flaring snouts. These, then, were men of the Order of the Boar, infamous in Europe for its savagery. There were six of them standing by their leader, a tall, slender man whose mask was of gold and bronze and much more delicately wrought, almost to the point of caricaturing the mask of the Order. The man leaned on the arms of two of his companions, one squat and bulky, the other virtually a giant with naked arms and legs of almost inhuman hairiness. Was the leader ill or wounded? wondered Hawkman. There seemed to be something almost artificial about the way he leaned on his men, something theatrical. Hawkman thought then that he knew who the boar leader was. It was almost certainly the renegade Frenchman, Guillaume de Berck, once a brilliant painter and architect who had joined the cause of Grand Bretagne long ago before they had conquered France. An enigma, de Berck, but a dangerous man, for all the affected illness. That's our introduction to, to Guillaume de Berck, a critical and quite enjoyable character. For all of his, uh, his his affectations, and uh, it makes me chuckle quite frequently. The descriptions of De Verk and his capering and carrying on. I yeah. love this character. He's great. His, his affected coughing. I just imagine him just there with like some like frilly handkerchief going. <coughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Like... yeah, it's wonderful. It's completely ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. he's a great character. So he, he uses a one of his one of his fellas hands him a megaphone. Uh, I love that image as well. It's like, <laughs> and then someone hands him a megaphone, and he's like, he starts taunting Hartmoon because <laughs> they've got they've got Oladan, and it's uh, essentially he's saying, "Come out, or we'll we'll do him in." And they have a back and forth, and Hartmoon's, "Well, I don't trust you," and the uh, as well, you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> Oladan breaks the tension, however, by breaking free, and he chucks himself over a parapet <laughs> <laughs> in a suicide dive. Nicely yep. breaks the tension. Hartman, of course, not impressed with this. And after some buggering about and running up and down roofs and stairs, he comes first to first with Deverk and his gang. And once again, as we just mentioned, we get this brilliant character beat with Deverk. He found the entrance to the tower and entered in time to hear the clatter of metal shod feet as Deverk and his warriors descended. He chose a spot on the staircase, which was enclosed, where he'd be able to take the Grand Britannians one at a time. De Verk was the first to appear, stopping suddenly as he saw the glowering Hawkmoon, then reaching with gauntlet hand for his long blade. You were foolish not to take the chance of escape your friend's silly sacrifice gave you, said the bar masked mercenary, contemptuously. Now, like it or not, I suppose we shall have to kill you. <coughs> he began to cough, doubling up in apparent agony, leaning weakly against the wall. He signed limply to the squat man behind him. One of those Hawkmen had seen helping De Verk across the battlements. Oh, my dear Duke Dorian, I must apologise. My infirmity is liable to seize me at the most inconvenient moments. Accardo, would you? 
<laughs> it's brilliant. <laughs> I love it. The powerfully built Akada sprang forward, grunting and pulling a short hafted battle axe from his belt. He tugged out his sword with his free hand and chuckled with pleasure. Thanks, master. Now let's see how the Nurmask prances. And he moved like a cat to attack. Absolutely fabulous. He's he's such a cad, Daverk. I love it. But of course, we do find out just how dangerous Daverk is. After Hawkmoon bests Akada, obviously, because Hawkmoon is the hero of the story. Of course. Akado falls to the foot of the stairs, dazed, and then, well, the Verk pushes up his mask, sucks in a breath, and he turns out to be fast and deadly, and he pushes Hawkmoon onto the defensive. And Hawkmoon ends up stuck in a little bit of a position because he's got Akado up to one side of him, who's coming round, and he's got the Verk hard pressing him with quite remarkable dueling skills. He's forgot his cough at this point, and he's turned out to be quite handy. But fortunately, much like Chewbacca, Holodan's sudden apparent death only lasts about 35 seconds. Yep. And he turns up to clatter Ricardo over the noggin. He says, I, I live. But do not ask me how. It's a mystery to me. And he brought the flat of the blade down on Ricardo's helmet with a great clang. And Ricardo collapsed again. And we'll find out <laughs> how we got away with that very shortly. But they are, after a brief battle and the do dispatch some of the Grand Britannians, they're taken alive because Deverk wants them alive and they go down under a pile of metal-clad bodies. That's the end of Chapter 2. Now, Chapter 3 is a little bit of one of those convenient... Um, Very convenient. <laughs> Deus Ex Machina kind of <laughs> setups that you get in a Mocock story where it's, oh no, hey, yep. they've been captured. Everything's <laughs> everything's a ginnum. And uh, some ghost blocks. <laughs> <laughs> some ghost blocks sign up and rescue them. <laughs> Pretty much. That's basically how this chapter goes. Yeah. <laughs> and we find out that that's, uh, that's how Oladan still lives, is because they basically picked him up and carried him uh, away from the uh, becoming a puddle on the floor. Yeah. And whilst it's interesting, it's, it's, it's quite interesting world building, and actually the, they're going to get sent on a little quest, a Diddy quest, shortly, by these wraith folk of Soriandum. And... It is a mercifully brief side quest as when it comes to the type of things that you get in Mokok. I mean, God, when you get to the second Corum trilogy, oh, those yeah. books are just wall-to-wall filler quests. <laughs> you know, I, I loved that trilogy back in the day. Yeah. I reread it again five, about five years ago before I even yeah. started doing the podcast, and I found it really tiresome. But anyway, we're, <laughs> we're, we're a few years away from getting to that. Yeah, I, I love that he just goes on a side quest instead of, uh, you know, the final battle is like, oh, the final battle is upon us. Wait, uh, actually, hold on. I gotta, I gotta go over here real quick. And uh, yeah. oh, I missed it entirely. And everyone's yeah. really mad at me. I wonder why. <laughs> yeah, he, he deserved to get brained by the yeah, end. A little bit, I think. A yeah. little bit. <laughs> yeah, pe- pe- people who haven't read the second card trilogy, I've just spoiled it for you, and I apologize. All but right. the great thing about this. And the great thing about this chapter, even though um, it's it's a, just a, a very convenient way of moving the story on and giving him a little quest to obtain something actually, which which does become super super important to the plot later on. So it's it's not just a it's not just, it is a MacGuffin in a way, but it actually does become useful a little bit further down the line. We do get some more really really wonderful Deverk action. They were flung face down on the coarse rock. Oh, I tell you what. Why don't we do a reading? Okay. You should be Hawkmoon. Okay. Right. Okay. So they were flung face down on the coarse rock. They lay there until a booted foot turned them over to blink into the light of a guttering torch held by the squat Akado, whose battered mask seemed to snarl in glee. Deverk, mask still pushed back to expose his face, stood between Akado and the huge hairy warrior Hawkmoon had seen earlier. Deverk had a brocade scarf to his lips and he leaned heavily on the giant's arm. Devet coughed theatrically and smiled down at his prisoners. I fear I must leave you soon, gentlemen. This subterranean air is not good for me. However, it should do little harm to two such robust young fellows as yourself. You will not have to stay here more than a day, I assure you. I have sent a request for a larger ornithopter that will be able to bear the two of you back to Sicilia, where my main force is now encamped. You have taken Sicilia already? You have conquered the isle? Aye. The Dark Empire wastes little time. I, in fact, <laughs> am the hero of Sicilia. It was my leadership that subjugated the island so swiftly. 
But that triumph was no special one, for the Dark Empire has many capable captains like myself. We have made many gains in Europe during these past few months, and in the East, too. But the Kmarg still stands. That must irritate the King Emperor. Oh, the Kmarg cannot last long besieged. We are concentrating our particular attention on that little province. Why, it may have fallen already. Not while Count Brass lives. Just so. I heard he was badly wounded, and his Lieutenant von Villach slain in a recent battle. Hartman could not tell whether de Verk was lying. He let no emotion show on his face, but the news had shocked him. Was the Camargue ready to fall? And if so, what would become of Yzelda? Planning that news disturbs you, de Verk murmured. But fear not, Duke, for when the Camargue falls it will be in my safekeeping if all goes well. I plan to claim the province as my reward for capturing you, and these, my boon companions, he continued, indicating his brutish servants, I will elevate to rule the Camargue when I cannot. They share all aspects of my life, my secrets, my pleasures. It's only fair that they should share my triumph. A cardo, I will make steward of my estates, and I think I shall make Peter here a count. From within the giant's mask came an animal grunt. Devek smiled. Peter has few brains, but his strength and his loyalty are without question. Perhaps I'll replace Count Brass with him. You are a wily beast, Devek, but I will not let you goad me into an outburst if that's what you desire. I'll bide my time. Perhaps I'll escape you yet, and if I do, you may live in terror for the day when our roles are reversed and you are in my power. Ha! <laughs> I fear you are too optimistic, Duke. Rest here. Enjoy the peace, for you'll know none when you get to Grand Bretagne. And with a mocking bow, de Verk left, his men following. The torchlight faded, and Hawkmoon and Oladan were left in darkness. I fucking love de Verk, and I love the fact that his big bloke is called Peter. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely brilliant. Peter this, of little brains. <laughs> yeah, this giant, hairy, almost giant, <laughs> who, who only wears a breastplate and pants with massive hairy legs and hairy arms, is called Peter. <laughs> it's just, it's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. Anyway, they quite handily get rescued by Wraith dudes after De Verk and Co. bugger off to, to await their bigger ornithopter. And the Wraith dudes have a gaffer. Rinal, Rhinal, let's call him Rinal. He reveals that the Grand Britannians want to level Soriandum and build a massive ornithopter base. And that's a problem for the Wraith folk because they are essentially tied to the very structure and, and, and heart of the city. So if it's leveled, that's a bit of a problem. Hence, Hawkmoon gets his quest. And bum, what is bum, the quest? Bum. So they've hidden all of their old machinery because they are an ancient race, who maybe even predate the Cataclysm. So all their machines are off somewhere in a cave, protected by a mechanical beast. And they, for, for some vague reason, they can't go and do it themselves, so they need to send Hawkmoon, and for a similarly vague reason, they can't help him out with the mechanical beast, but they can yep. give him a handy little sonic key sort yeah. of thing, which will sonic open the way. Big. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> yeah. Which will open the way, get them in there. All they've got to do is get this MacGuffin, this machine, and find their way around the mechanical beast. Yeah, uh, easy, oh. easy yeah, peasy. It's fine. But these wraith folk, you know, they uh, they have their super science. They think, you know, these bodies are burdensome. Why don't we uh, just transition into wraith folk and we'll be able to float around all over the place? And, you know, mm. we'll just hang out in our city and no one will be able to find us. They didn't think to uh, make their super powerful device within reach of their mm. own set limits, but there you have it. <laughs> yeah. They're not nearly as smart as they think they are. No. In fact, <laughs> they've been a bit daft. Yeah, really. But at least they, uh, you know, yeah, made a thing capable of opening any lock, which is how they escape. <laughs> So you have your little sonic lockpick, <laughs> and it is literally right here. It says, capable of opening any lock. So yeah. bzz, 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 Hawk, Moon, yeah. and Oladan are free. Uh, now help us <laughs> to go get this uh, this machine. Yeah. In, in all honesty, when it comes to all this pre-cataclysm super science, it's all quite lame. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unless it's killing <laughs> machines, it's all pretty lame. Well, as uh, we will see, this killing machine that they were able to make is pretty awesome. It's something yeah. like out of a Judas Priest album cover. That's exactly what I thought. Which oh, Judas yeah. Priest album is it that's got the crazy lion, chrome, 
dragon oh, thing oh, on the cover. Uh, Defenders of the Faith. Defenders of the Faith. That's what I thought oh, yeah. about when I, when I read the description. Me I'll too. <laughs> yeah. Chapter 4, The Mechanical Beast. Hartwood and Oladan feast on wine and took her care of the wraith folk who nicked it from the Grand Britannians. They'll just be very well looked after. If, they did, if, if only they didn't have to have this quest, they'd be, they'd be doing fine. <laughs> so they're gently carried outside the city to go and find the machine and, of course, figure out how to get past the Guardian, the Beast Machine. Uh, they find the cave really fucking easily. No problem. He uses a gadget to open the way. There's uh, some nice descriptions of the weird hallways and throbbing... Actually, it's not a throbbing orifice. It's not Elric, this. So there are no weird <laughs> throbbing orifices. There's, there's like a, a, a pearlescent wall and they can sense that something's behind it leaning on it. Oladan does get a little bit windy, but Hawkmoon don't give two shits. Oladan looks dubiously at the wall. Perhaps we should reconsider. After all, if we wasted our lives uselessly, we... Dot, dot, dot. But Hawkmoon was already activating the instrument, and the protecting wall had begun to change colour as the strange, cold wind struck their faces. From behind the wall came an awesome wail of pain and bewilderment. The walls turned to pink, faded, and revealed the machine beast. The wall's disappearance seemed to have disturbed it for an instant, for it made no move towards them. It crouched on metal feet, towering over them, its multicoloured scales half-blinding them. The length of its back, save for its neck, was a mass of knife-sharp horns. It had a body positioned somewhat like an ape's, with short hind legs and long forelegs ending in hands of taloned metal. Its eyes were multifaceted, like a fly's, glowing with shifting colours, and its snout was full of razor-sharp metal teeth. Yeah, that's awesome. That's so cool. Cue the yeah. freaking guitarist. Bah, bah, yeah. bah, 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 Beyond the mechanical beast, they could see great heaps of machinery stacked in orderly rows about the walls. The room was vast. Somewhere in the middle of it, on his left, Hawkman saw the two crystalline devices Ranel had described. Silently, he pointed to them, then made to dash past the monster into the storeroom. This quest... They've found the cave, they've gone in, they've opened the door, they've seen a big beast. Hawkmoon straight away sees what they've gone for and runs over to get it. This is the easiest fucking quest in the world, and the shortest quest in the <laughs> world, apart from just getting through the fight with the beast. Long story short, Oladan is useless and gets knocked out. <laughs> Hawkmoon binds, uh, blinds it uh, because he finds, uh, well... A bell-shaped instrument <laughs> with a button Perfect. on it. That, yeah, that yeah, might be a there. weapon. Yeah, just sitting might right be a there. Weapon. And it turns out it's uh, it's it, it does actually have an effect on the beast, and it slows it down slightly. And he manages to blind it, and then they escape with the goods. Oladin's got a headache, but otherwise, no sweat. A minor concussion. He'll be fine. Yeah. Fortunately, the beast, of course, makes another appearance. Which makes all this whole session worthwhile. Yep. And and that was pretty much it. That was that was the quest chapter. It was over in a flash. We got a great description of a, of a heavy metal beast, and uh, they managed to get away from it really really easily. <laughs> so, chapter five: the machine. They get back. Rhinos chuffed to bits, and it turns out they find out from one of the other wraith folk that these machines are. There's two of them, and there are some kind of dimensional transportation device, and Rhinel wants it so they can move Soriandum effectively out of this dimension. There's a strange exchange where Rhinel's reluctant to actually activate it because it will leave Hartman and Oladan behind with the Grand Britannians. But this female wraith like her says, oh, it's all right, we're mates with the warrior and jet and gold, and he said it'll probably be all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, the warrior jet and gold said it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Yeah, you yeah. Know. So a trustworthy out, figure. Yeah, it turns out they're now the warrior and <laughs> jet and gold. And there's also a reference to um, the rune staff looking after him, and that's uh, the second time Hartmoon has had the rune staff mentioned in the same breath as his name. So it's another little mention. And at this point, these bar warriors, who there's twenty of them now. How the fuck this ornithopter carried twenty bar warriors, and they need a bigger <laughs> ornithopter to take them over again? Also, that's a look a bit creaky. But they're climbing up the outside of the tower. They want to get in, so Hawkman and Oladan are having a scrap at the top of the tower to keep them out. So Rhinel thinks, right, okay, fair play. Maybe we should move on. The machine, Hawkman called desperately. Use it, Rhinel. We cannot hold them for long. From behind him, there came a musical thrumming sound, and Hawkman felt slightly dizzy as his sword met that of the next attacker. Then everything began to vibrate rapidly, and the walls of the house turned bright red. Outside in the street, the bar warriors were yelling. 
not in surprise, but in outright fear. Hartman could not understand why the sight terrified them so much. He could see now that the whole city had turned the same vibrating scarlet and seemed to be shaking itself to pieces in harmony with the thrumming of the machine. Then, abruptly, sound and city vanished, and Hartman was falling gently earthwards. He heard the voice of Rhinel faint and disappearing say, We have left you the twin of this machine. It is our gift to aid you against your enemies. It has the ability to shift whole areas of the earth into slightly different dimensions of space-time. Our enemies will not have sorry and them now. Then Hartman landed on rocky ground, Oladan close by, and saw that there was not a trace of the city. Instead there was pitted ground that looked as if it had been recently ploughed. Some distance away were the troops of Grand Bretagne, Deverk among them, and Hartman could now see why they were screaming in terror. The machine beast had come at last to the city and was attacking the Boar Warriors. Everywhere were the battered and bleeding corpses of Grand Bretagnians. Ere Jean Badeverk, who had his own sword drawn and was joining them in the battle, the Grand Bretagnians were trying to destroy the monster. Its metal spines shook in fury, its metal teeth clashed in its head and its metal talons ripped and rended armour and flesh. The beast will take care of them, Hartman said. Look, our horses. About three hundred yards away stood the two bewildered steeds. Hartman and Aladan ran for them and were soon mounted, riding away from the sight of Soriandum and the carnage that the mechanical beast was making out of Verk's balls. Unlucky Grand Britannians. No, they just got torn to shreds and 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 i imagine somewhere through the multiverse painkiller just started blaring all their minds <laughs> yeah. do, 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 do. every time every time the beast comes up that's just what pops into my head <laughs> yeah yeah and if if you were to do i mean i, I know that the the bbc apparently are doing a, an adaptation of the history of the rune staff but the saddest thing in the world is that it won't be a rocking heavy metal adaptation <sighs> i remember years ago reading when i read this probably for the first time or maybe the second time in my teens i was listening to a lot of celtic frost and on into the pandemonium the last days of babylon by celtic frost there's a short probably only two minute song which is orchestral and i can't remember the name of it but it's the kind of music that you would have playing as a column of grand britannian warriors come over the prow of a hill with dust coming up from the horses' hooves and the cameras behind them and you pan down to a valley and you can see a vast Grand Britannian camp of tents and war machines. And I always thought if you were going to do something like this, you need that avant-garde metal soundtrack. It's the only thing that would make it work in terms of music. The only thing. The only avant-garde thing. metal, big riffs, all that BBC, stuff. get on it. Yeah. Get it right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. You need to hire Tom G. Warrior. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> As the music supervisor. Otherwise, Tom it just ain't going to work. Tom G. Warrior, full name. What more do you need on the resume? Hire that man. <laughs> yeah. And also, I've written massive letters on the credits. That's right. <laughs> yeah. They've got the twin machine is secure. The head off. Hartmoon is a little bit circumspect, considering Deverk's taunts, Rita Camargue, and the fall of Cecilia. And he realised that it's complicated their return journey to a Camargue that's pretty much isolated with all passages to it probably blocked off by Grand Britannian advances. In some ways, this is a handy excuse to turn this into a, a massive travelogue oh, and yeah. take them on a very, very long diversion. And but boy, is it. The fall of the Euphrates north and cross into Turkey and find an inn in Baratcha. And there they fall in with a band of traders and their gaffer. Salim, and this is a, a really fantastic opportunity for Mike to include a little indulgence into his sartorial obsessions. And I really, really love the description of the traders. The traders were swarthy men with blue black hair and beards that gleamed with oil. They were dressed in leather shirts and brightly coloured divided kilts of wool. Over these clothes, they wore woven cloaks, also of wool in geometric designs of purple, red, and yellow. These cloaks, they tell the travellers, showed that they were the men of Yenahan, merchants of Ankara. At their waists were carved sabres with richly decorated hilts and engraved blades, worn and scabbarded. These traders were as used to fighting as they were to bartering. And they discuss the nature of the threat with, with this guy, Salim. And if you come to this book, as I think, 
people often did back in the day without having read the first one. I think you could pick this up and read it without necessarily having read the first one. Obviously, you've got the references to Yzelda and everything else, but in terms of actual structure, you could yeah. read this as a standalone book. The context clues would probably tell you all you really need to know. And yeah. so much happens so quickly yeah. that, uh, yeah, you just be, all right, we're in, it's going, it's very fast-paced. Yeah, and I think we should do a, another little reading here on this sure. page. You, you can be Hartmoon, I'll be Salim, because Hartmoon sure. gives a really fantastic description of just what a bunch of rotters the Grand Britannians are. I have little news of the world, but I believe you. It is the way of Grand Britannia to take with gold rather than take with force. Only if gold is no longer of use will they produce their weapons and armies. As I thought, you would not then think Turkey is safe from the Western Wolves. Not any part of the world. Even Amarek is safe from their ambition. They dream of conquering lands that might not even exist save in fables. They plan to take Asia Communista, though they must find it first. Arabia and the East are mere camping grounds for their armies. But could they have such power? They have the power. They have a madness, too, which makes them savage, cunning, and inventive. I've seen Londra, capital of Grand Britain, and its vast architecture is that of brilliant nightmares made solid. I've seen the King Emperor himself in his throne globe of milky fluid, a wizened immortal with the golden voice of a youth. I've seen the laboratories of the sorcerer scientists, innumerable caverns of bizarre machines, many whose functions have yet to be rediscovered by the Grand Britannians themselves. And I have talked with their nobles, learned of their ambitions, know them to be more insane than anything you or any other normal man could imagine. They are without humanity, have little feeling for each other, and none at all for those who they regard as lower species, that is, all those not of Grand Britain. They crucify men, women, children, and animals to decorate and mark the roads to and from their conquests. Ah, oh, come now, Duke Dorian. You exaggerate. I tell you this, traitor of Turkey, I cannot exaggerate the evil of Grand Britain. I, I believe you, but I wish that I could not. For how can the little nation of Turkey withstand such might and cruelty? Ah, I can offer no solution. I would say that you should band together. Do not let them weaken you with gold and gradual encroachment in your lands. But I would waste my rhetoric if I tried, for men are greedy and will not see the truth for the gleam of the coin. Resist them, I would say, with honor and honest courage, with wisdom and with idealism. Yet those who resist them are vanquished and tortured, see their wives raped and torn apart before their eyes, their children become playthings of warriors and heaped on fires lit to burn whole cities. But if you do not resist, if you escape death in battle, then the same could still happen to you, or you and yours becoming cringing things, less than human, willing to perform any indignity, any act of evil to save your skins. I spoke of honesty, and honesty forbids me to encourage you with brave talk of noble battle and warriors' deaths. I seek to destroy them. I am their declared enemy, but I have great allies and considerable luck, and even I feel that I cannot forever escape their vengeance, though I have done so several times. I can only advise those who would save something to resist the minions of King Huon. Use cunning. Use cunning, my friend. It is the only weapon we have against the Dark Empire. Pretend to serve them, you mean? I did so. I'm alive now and comparatively free. I will remember your words, Westerner. Remember them all. For the hardest compromise to make is when you decide to appear to compromise. Often the deception becomes the reality long before you realize it. I understand you. How long, I wonder, will it be? So much of Europe is already theirs. Have you heard anything of the province called the Kmark? A land of horned werebeasts, is it not? And half-human monsters with mighty powers, who have somehow managed to stand against the Dark Empire. They are led by a metal giant, the Brass Count. You have heard much that is legend. Count Brass is flesh and blood, and there are few monsters in the Kmark. The only horned beasts are the bulls of the marshlands and the horses too. And have they still resisted the Dark Empire? Heard you of how Count Brass fares, or his Lieutenant von Villac, or Count Brass's daughter Yzelda? I heard Count Brass dead, and his lieutenant too. But of a girl I heard nothing, and as far as I know the Camargue still stands. Your information is not certain enough. 
I cannot believe that if Count Brass is dead, the K-Mark still stands. If Count Brass goes down, so does the province. Well, I speak only of rumours surrounding other rumours. We trade as a sure of local gossip, but most of what we hear of the West is vague and obscure. You come from the Camargue, do you not? It is my adopted home, if it still exists. Oladan put his hand on Hawkman's shoulder. Do not be depressed, Duke Dorian. You said yourself that Trader Salim's information is barely credible. Wait until we are nearer our goal before you lose hope. And then Hawkman buries his face in wine and mutton for the rest of the evening to try and get over it. So he's quite de- quite despondent with all this news. Yeah, it's kind of a bummer. <laughs> yeah, that is a bummer. And that's I think that's the longest two pieces of dialogue Hawkman probably has. It's certainly so far into this. I'm, I don't think he has dialogue that lengthy probably for the remainder of the entire sequence. But it's really I don't good. I think even in the whole of the first book. Yeah, it's really the grim. The we get of him. Yeah, it's really yeah. grim and it's really um, evocative of not just how bad the Grand Britannians are, but how bitter he is about the whole situation. Oh, Particularly yeah. given that his love for Yiselda has kind of awakened him from his, from his traumatised, um, almost uh, catatonia that we found him in midway through The Jewel in the Skull. So chapter six, titled The Mad God's Ship. The sail with Salim, and he helps them up to obtain passage aboard the Smiling Girl, a ship called the Smiling Girl, which is an absolutely filthy scow, captained by a shifty-eyed, greasy-mustachioed Captain Musa. And I think there's two or three occasions where he's described as doing something shiftily. Yeah. <laughs> so so it sounds, sounds like a bit of a rotter. Uh, but actually, it turns out to be kind of all right. I think there's a bit, a little bit of misdirection from, from Moorcock there, because I was... Instantly expecting him to turn on them and be uh, and be a shithead, but apparently not. After uh, an encounter with the drunk first mate, it was quite amusing because the, the first mate is so drunk. The captain says he has the look of a drunk, and Hawkmoon thinks that he has to rescue him from falling overboard, but he he, he doesn't. He's, and he, he acknowledges, yes, he definitely has the look of a drunk. But the first mate does uh, does pop up again in quite an amusing fashion. But they've they've spotted uh, uh, what they think is um, a raft with people on it, and Captain Musa he's he's not interested. He doesn't want anything to do with it. But Hawkmoon being Hawkmoon and being a massive hero, he strips off, gets ripped ties a rope around his waist, dives in the roaring sea and swims out to this raft uh, to find, ironically, it's three boar-masked men, two of <laughs> whom are fighting. One of them is de Verk, And he realises Hawkman's there, so he does his thing and he shoves the two fighting boars overboard and they <laughs> sink to their dooms. Oh, poor Peter. Or Poor Peter. Peter. We, we, we could have got, I'm sure we could have got more fun out of Peter, but <laughs> no. Peter sadly sinks to the bottom of the sea. And a cardo. <laughs> yeah. We have to, we have to discuss Devark because he gets back aboard. Sorry, he gets aboard the, uh, the smiling girl. He's incredibly grateful to Hartmoon for being rescued. He's instantly like, right, um, can you get me some wine? <laughs> I'm hungry. <laughs> Uh, but he does say to Hawkman, he says, well, you know, essentially my life now is yours. You've saved my life. And he takes off his armour and he dresses in a green velvet jacket and green velvet breeches. Swish. Oh, yeah. So he's got rid of his armour. And I'm sure that there's an interview from the 1970s with Moorcock where he's wearing a green velvet jacket and green velvet trousers. I think <laughs> Moorcock has dressed him in his favourite clobber. There's this interview, and I can't remember which one it is, but he's, he's really ostentatiously lighting cigarettes but barely smirking them, as mm. if it's as if it's an affectation, Moorcock. Did and, he have uh, that cool little uh, yes. beard at the time? Yes. Okay. Yeah, he does, mm. yeah. And he's, he's talking to a journalist, and, yeah, straight away I just thought, he's he's, he's writing what he'd wear <laughs> at this point. <laughs> it's, uh, so he's telling us, this is code to tell us, actually, that Deverk... Well, he's, he's, he's a bit of a cad. He's been up to no good, but actually, he might just be all right. So it all gets quite civil, but the pleasantries are interrupted by a sail on the horizon. And this is where our wonderful ship's mate pops up again. Who are they? Not a Grand Britannian ship, by the look of it, Deverk said. Even one of those probably would not bother to attack us. 
stuttered Captain Musa. No, that is a ship crewed by those belonging to the cult of the Mad God. They're from Muscovia, and in recent months have begun to terrorise these waters. That's topical, isn't it? A Mad God from Muscovia terrorising the Ukraine and Crimea. Uh, well. How about that? They definitely seem to have the intention of attacking, Deverk said slightly. With your permission, Duke Dorian, I'll go below and don my sword and armour. I'll get my weapons too, Holodan said. I'll bring your sword for you. No point in fighting. It was the mate gesticulating with his bottle. Best throw ourselves in the sea now. <laughs> Aye, Captain Musa nodded, looking after Deverk and Holodan as they went to fetch the weapons. He's right, we'll be outnumbered and they'll tear us to pieces. If we're captured, they'll torture us for days. Hawkman started to say something to the captain, then turned as he heard a splash. The mate had gone, as good as his word. <laughs> Hawkman rushed to the side, but could see nothing. Don't bother to help him. Follow him, the skipper said, for he's the wisest of us all. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. The ship was bearing down on them now, its black sail painted with a pair of great red wings, and in the centre of them was a huge bestial face, howling as if in the throes of maniacal laughter. Crowding the decks were scores of naked men wearing nothing but sword belts and metal-studded collars. Drifting across the water came a weird sound that Hartman could not at first make out. Then he glanced at the sail again and knew what it was. It was the sound of wild, insane laughter. A sound as if the damned of hell were moved to merriment. The Mad God's ship, said Captain Muzo, his eyes beginning to fill with tears. Now we die. That's just <laughs> su such a great image. Oh, yeah. Such a great image. Crowding the decks were scores of naked men wearing nothing but sword belts and metal studded collars. Also Amazing. something out of a Judas Priest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Really yeah. all that all they needed was gimp masks. And, yeah, really. And the, the image would be complete. It's, it's <laughs> Little leeches or something. Just wonderful. Yeah. Fantastic, wonderful. yeah. That so, would be pretty intimidating. <laughs> it really was. <laughs> He is the wisest of all as he jumps into the he, sea. He certainly is. Yeah, you wouldn't, hang, you wouldn't hang around, would you? You no. wouldn't hang around. So, uh, chapter seven is called The Ring on the Finger, and it's basically one f massive fight, and it's just full of delicious Mococ nautical fight action. And I don't know why, but I always find the most memorable Mococ fight descriptions are always the ones on board ships. The descriptions of slipping in blood on decks and, and all oh, yeah. that business is, is always, always good stuff. And I'm not going to read a lot of it, but just the first two chapters. Sorry, the first two paragraphs. Hawkman became separated from his comrades, did not know if they lived or had been killed. The prancing warriors flung themselves at him, but he clutched his battle blade in both hands and swung it about him in a great arc, this way and that, surrounding himself with a blare of bright steel. He was covered in blood from head to foot. Only his eyes gleamed, blue and steady, from the visor of his helmet, and all the while the Mad God's men laughed. Laughed, even as their heads were chopped from their necks, and their limbs from their bodies. Ooh, ooh, visceral. Wonderful. He's he's not in his hippie regalia anymore. He's he's back in his armor. Yes. Sadly. Yeah, yeah there's, a, there's a really cool bit where Hartman's getting pressed, and then just a mass of steel and mail just like falls from the rigging next to him and crushes some of these guys and, and it's Deverka just pops back to his feet and is hewing <laughs> left and right. It's it's just great stuff. But oh, yeah. um Hartman's tactical nous and daring do secures the Mad God's ship and as a result saves the smiling girl. Because they get on the uh the the pirate ship, they cut the the hooks and free it, and as it starts to drift away, all the Mad God's men just start jumping in the sea to try and get back to it, and uh, laughing, all drown. Almost all. Some get on the ship, they come a cropper pretty quickly. Maybe six or seven of them get on the ship, and they're cut down. Not only is it a cracking scrap, not only does Hawkman show some of his tactical grip on the situation, not only does he save them, he takes over the, the, uh, the Mad God's ship, and when they look back at the Smiling Girl, most of the crew are still alive, and have actually managed to, to stay safe. So he saved both ships, and now they've got a ship packed with swag. Okay, a few corpses. And one mummified corpse is wearing a familiar ring that Oladan finds. And he says, uh, says to Hawkman, this looks familiar. And Hawkman is convinced it's his elder's ring, but it's not his elder's hand. Deverk has some knowledge regarding some shenanigans that have gone on around the Camargue, of course, and that a captured Camargue captain was threatened because he was a German mercenary and his family were threatened and bullied into trying to kidnap his elder. 
but it failed. So they now know that attempts have been made. That one may have failed, but others may have succeeded. So, of course, Hartman now is overcome with anxiety about the fact that he's got Yazelda's ring, but Yazelda's not there. What gives? What on earth is going on? Dvek also reveals some of his, his true knowledge of the state of the Kamag, that Count Brass is alive, although he was wounded in the battle. And they come across a survivor of the Mad Crew, who they managed to knock out, tie up, and when he comes round, he's not mad anymore. And it turns out it's, this is Corianthum of Kerch. And he's come round and he's lucid, but confused. And it turns out the Mad God and his cult have these people out there doing his bidding. Oladan says he's disappointed that they're not a traditional cult. <laughs> but, <laughs> but actually, these are uh, like drug fueled. Yeah, like almost, brainwashed. But, yeah, brainwashed, maybe unwilling recruits. Yeah. And no gets memory. A bit confu- yeah, it gets a little bit confused at this point because now the Mad God is described as being in Ukraine, not Muscovia. Anywhere. It's that way. But Hartman's got a plan. They go to Simferipol, where the Smiling Gale also docks. They sell all the loot. But Hartman being Hartman, I think um, Deverk would quite happily just go away a rich man. But Hartman being the hero finds the most trusted merchant in Simferipol so that the treasure can be used to pay the families of the people who were kidnapped by the cult. Quite a, a noble thing to do from Hartman. Quite impressive. Mm-hmm. And then he has the, they get the machine back because the Smiling Gale is docked, so they get all the gear back. And then they decide to sail and await the attentions of the owner of the ship because Coriantum told them that the captain of the ship split before they were sent on the attack and they expect the captain to come back. So they lay something of a trap. Mm. Ooh, bum, bum, bum. Yeah. <laughs> Chapter 8, The Mad God's Man. Well, long story short, the plan works. The plan works pretty damn quickly, although actually it takes a week. For more than a week, the black ship drifted, usually becalmed, for the wind had dropped to almost nothing. By Hartman's reckoning, they were drifting close to the channel that separated the Black Sea from the Azov Sea near to Kerch, where Corianthum had been recruited. Unusually, Kerch isn't an altered name. Kerch really is a town mm. on the channel between the Black Sea and the Azov Sea. So obviously, Mocock was getting lazy at this point and not coming up with alternative names. <laughs> Deverk lounged in a hammock. He had hung for himself amidships, occasionally coughing theatrically and remarking on his boredom. <laughs> Yeah. I'm so bored. <laughs> I'm so bored. <laughs> Oladon sat often in the crow's nest scanning the sea while Hartman paced the decks, beginning to wonder if his plan had any substance to it other than his need to know what had become of his elder. He was even beginning to doubt that the ring had been hers, deciding that perhaps several such rings had been made in the Camargue over the years. Oh, yeah, that's something that you probably failed to realise. Your Zelda's ring might have been from Ratners or somewhere. And actually, it was just like 10 bob. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. The ship they awaited arrives. A sail appeared on the horizon coming from the northwest. Oladan saw it first and called to Hartman to come on deck. Hartman rushed up and peered ahead. It might be the ship they awaited. And they go below. An hour passes and then they hear footsteps on the ship. And they are boarded by Captain Shagarov. Which sounds like something from a Carry On film from the 1970s. <laughs> it sounds like something from Carry On Pirates. Captain Shagarov. He's a big bugger. He's six foot five. He's got uh, very nice plaited hair. But he gets very short shrift from our heroes. They capture him. And I've got to say, this chapter is over in a hell of a rush. Book one concludes in hell of a rush. It turns out that he's little more than an unscrupulous pirate in the employ of the cult. And he's been under instructions to send girls to the Mad God. So whenever they get girls, they all get sent to the Mad God in Ukraine or Crimea or wherever it is in any particular paragraph. Human and, trafficker. Yeah, he's a trafficker. And it doesn't end well, end well for him because Hartmoon says, you know, you're going to be judged. And he says, by whose justice? Hartmoon says, by Dorian Hartmoon's justice. And, <laughs> sticks a, and sticks a noose around his neck. He has a bit of a struggle. Oh, yeah. Meanwhile, Oladan's covered the ship in oil. The pirate ship... He's docked with them, and they have a bit of a conversation with the crew. The pirate crew don't want anything to do with them. Captain Shagaroff struggles, ends up hanging. Oladan falls over because he's useless, 
accidentally sets the <laughs> ship on fire, and they uh, and they, but fortunately they have a skiff with three horses on it all ready to go. Yeah, so, how big was this ship? They have a skiff big yeah. enough inside, and that's the thing too. He describes it as like the skiff is like nearly the size of the entire ship. It's like yeah. it's like Batman's motorcycle that comes out of the Batmobile. Yeah, but it's this like one's loaded the, with the, three the, horses. The turn a crank. Yeah, <laughs> and, and a skiff comes up through the deck with three horses on it, all ready to go. The fire, you fools! Oladan pointed to where de Verk was retreating from the flames which were now leaping high, touching the mast and superstructure. De Verk laughed. Let's to our little boat. Hartman flung his own brand after de Verk's and turned. But why don't they get away? The treasure, said de Verk as they lowered the skiff to the water, the frightened horses snorting as they sniffed the fire. They think the treasure's still aboard. As soon as the skiff was afloat, they clambered down the lines into the boat and cut themselves adrift. Now the black ship was a mass of flames and oily smoke. Outlined against the fire, the body of Shagarov swung, twisting this way and that as if trying to avoid the hellish heat. They let loose the skiff's sail, and the breeze filled it, bearing them away from the blazing vessel. Now, beyond it, they could see the pirate's ship, a sail smouldering as sparks from the other ship caught it. Some of the crew were busy putting it out, while others were reluctantly casting off the grappling lines. But now, it was touch and go whether the fire would spread through their own ship. Soon, the skiff was too far away for them to see whether the pirate ship was safe or not, and in the other direction, land was in sight, the land of Crimea, and beyond it, Ukrainia, and somewhere in Ukrainia they would find the Mad God, his followers, and possibly, Yzelda. End of book one. That's it. That's it. Thoughts on book one? A lot happens. A lot happens. Mm. They go to... Let's see, uh, Oladan hits his head so many times that by the end of it, he can't even stand straight and he falls down, dropping the torch on the old ship before, uh, you know, yeah. before, it's done, before it's time. Uh, let's see, they transfer, I mean, at least to two, three different ships. <laughs> like, they go into port, they go out to sea, they go, yeah, so a lot a lot happens. It's very, yeah. it's very fast paced and rereading it again, kind of going over it there, there, there are some really good moments, particularly the one that we kind of, uh, you know, read through, uh, where you get that kind of bit of dialogue from Hawkman, mm -hmm. which is nice because that's kind of the most that you ever really get to hear him speak yeah, and get like kind of a sense of his character anytime after his, you know, PTSD thing where he's just this, yeah, this, catatonic dude who's not really in his own skull um aside from that bit of dialogue there the only real sense that we get of who he is or you know how, how strong his beliefs are is when you know he says I, i'd kill any man woman or child of grand Bretagne at some point in the jewel of the skull and that's kind of the most uh powerful sense of of, of who he is as a character and i think that's mm. kind of you you definitely at least in this book kind of get more of his sort of heroic sense when he you know he's he's diving in, oh well we have to save those three yeah. men and you know which is kind of nice because as a character you I feel because he is so removed for most of the first book you really don't kind of get to know who he is or kind of connect with him in any sort of way mm. whereas with Elric I mean you know you you get a sense for who he is right off the bat pretty quickly. Um, same thing with Coram. You you get a sense for who he is, and you, you know you, you can kind of relate to them a bit. But with yeah. Hawkmoon, you know, you, 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 it's kind of he, he's too distant to really uh, relate to for most of the story. So now we're into book mm. two of this saga, and finally we're kind of starting to see uh, who he is, like who yeah. he really is. Yeah. yeah, he's he's becoming a more kind of active, engaged protagonist in yeah. this, isn't he? So whilst I have reservations about you know the story and the action which is just stuff happening yeah and you've got a couple of good scraps you've got the awesome heavy metal beast machine you've got some really really nice shining moments yeah the world building in books one and two of during the skull is almost unrivaled in any other mocock stuff for me i love it it's better world building than anything you got in the young kingdoms in any of the elric stories it's absolutely fabulous. This is all... It's hard to latch on to anything. It doesn't yeah. really 
have any sort of time to marinate or resonate with you. It's That's just right. kind of, yeah, it's just action yeah. leading Absolutely to action, right. leading to action. I mean, it's not boring. It's very fast paced, but much yeah. like, you know, an action movie where, you know, <laughs> you, you, you can't really kind of connect on a human level with the characters so much. Yeah. Um, and you can't really, you know, nothing really happens. It's that, yeah, that just really resonates with you as you're reading it. It's fun. Like you're yeah. not bored, but it's just, there's no kind of personal, connection or stake you don't really care too much about the characters mm. they're essentially they're just vehicles to get you from set piece a to set piece b even yeah like little sort of inconsistencies like you pointed out where the mad kings in muscovia oh well now he's in ukraine i mean it definitely kind of feels like yeah moorcock wrote this in three days on the shitter and Absolutely. Uh, it feels yeah. like <laughs> yeah this, Which, this is definitely yeah. a fug fugue state period of writing and it's you know it's, it's still a good read I think yeah. what saves this is the fact that you start to feel like Hawkman's got an arc in terms yeah. of him becoming more uh, engaged with his humanity, i.e. staging a rescue. Okay, it turns out to be Deverk and Peter and Okada. Okada. I think Okada is a food delivery business <laughs> in the UK. Okada and, and uh, poor Peter. I think the you know just the little passage about him wanting to use the proceeds of the treasure to go to the families of yeah. the the drugged naked dog collar <laughs> studded <death. laughs> yeah, a man dudes. gun crew there yeah yeah and and the other great thing of course is the introduction of Huylen de Verk who yeah. is just such a fantastic and entertaining character so flamboyant and just yeah. over the top and he yeah. is he's pretty amusing as he's just just constantly affecting this cough which i mean i have to imagine that you know even hawk moon's just like yeah i don't really buy that yeah, <laughs> I yeah. Mean, just the way it's described it's just so clearly affecting just like <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah well, i think i think once hawk moon actually got into a scrap with him he realized pretty quickly what a lot of our bollocks that was yeah. Yeah. So um, on the whole, enjoyable enough. On the whole, satisfying enough. But the character work is great. Oladan, useless. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely useless. But the character work is is really really great. So uh, so yeah, looking forward to book two just to find out who this mad god is. Yeah, and mm. see uh, a return of uh, the warrior of jet and gold, that most mysterious and. Uh, baited well whatever he is because i haven't uh, finished book two yet yeah so i will have to see what goes on with that yeah it's, it's, it's gonna turn up it's gonna go oh yeah the room stuff yep <laughs> oh yeah the room stuff um oh yeah no i can't help i'm gone again <laughs> yep <laughs> see ya <laughs> I'll, I'll be i'll be back when you least expect it <laughs> yeah yeah cool well you know what thanks again Dave, to drop it into Derry and Tom's to talk about the Mad God's Amulet book one. And uh, in a few weeks, we'll reconvene and look at book two. Sounds great. Happy to be back. It's been a pleasure. So cheers. Likewise. <laughs> Massive thanks to Dave once again for joining me and Derry and Tom's. Always a pleasure talking to you, Dave, and I look forward to picking it up with you again for book two. Sonus's albums are available now via sonusrocks.bandcamp.com or via Forbidden Records. There are cassette and CD options as well as digital, so please do check them out and give them your support. If you like rock, if you like space rock, if you like psychedelic rock, if you like doom, if you like stoner rock, any of those things, and you know what, even if you don't, check them out. You won't regret it. On the writing front, I'm delighted to say that all the print copies of Volume 2 of the Journal have found their way successfully around the globe to their destinations, and the PDF is available for all patrons, so check your recent posts. I had a lot of fun putting this one together, and I'm well on with Volume 3. On the audio front, the penultimate chapter of Volume 2 is scored, and it'll play this show out, so thanks again to Wayne, aka Nan Soundtracks, for his amazing music and inspiration. It was actually one of the song titles to a piece of music he sent me for his second album, based upon the journal, that actually inspired me to write the chapter. So it's a nice creative circle. It's lovely. Meanwhile, though, massive thanks, as ever, to our patrons. First, those without tear. And they are Anthony Piconti, Sebastian Weetabix, Tim Cardos, and Dave Dempster. 
and our chaos engineers, Andrew Cicluna, Andrew Van Ness, Anthony Porter, Benjamin Fletcher, Dave Griffiths. Good luck, Dave, with your 1984 production next week. Dave Voxman, Fred Keish, Jim Kirkland, John Lays, Jules Lawrence, Mal Pertwee, Matt Saltz, Menyon, Nelbert, Paul McRandall, Simon Perrins, and Tony Malazzo. And to Audio Gaderos, Alexander Harris, Dave Dalrymple, Ian Stead, Laws, Taylor, Matthew Broom, Steve Round, Toby White, and Tom Murphy. And of course, eternal thanks to our patron demons, Joe Monty, Clarky the Cruel, Andy Darby, Gareth Wilson, Imria, Janie Stim, The Lapsed Gamer, Liam J, Miles Reed Labato, Mortmain, Neil Burton, Norman Beresford, Randall Gatlin, and last, but never in the slightest bit least, Robert McMillan. Okay, so enough of my voice. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram with the handle at Breakfast Ruins. You can email us at breakfastruins at outlook.com. The webpage is breakfastintheruins.com. We've got our Patreon page. There are a few extra odds and sods on there. So after the transition, chapter 12 of the Journal of Gerard Arthur Connolly. Until the next time, take care, stay safe, and we'll see you again soon on the Moonbeam Roads. The Journal of Gerard Arthur Connolly Chapter 12 Welton Shown Stunned at how well my ankle was holding up to the brisk pace brain I was making along the sleepers, I called to her. What did you put on my ankle? It's a bit sore and I can't move it too well, but hell's bells. It was cleanly snapped, I'm sure of it. How on earth can it have healed so well in less than a week? She halted and sucked in a breath before exhaling loudly in mild exasperation. You speak so oddly, Connolly. Earth? You are a puzzle for sure. I thought the impatience perhaps a little exaggerated, and her eyes sparkled in the odd daylight. Hawking and spitting loudly into the reeds, narrowly missing a fat bug that angrily fart buzzed off on a zigzag course to avoid any subsequent fire, she looked upwards to judge the weather, or something, then continued her march onwards to wherever we were going. Call it magic. A huff was about all I could muster as I tried to keep up. Healing it may have been, and at a remarkable rate, but I wouldn't be playing for the Horstead Harriers any time soon. My mood didn't last. After an hour of trekking along the part submerged railway line, I was lagging behind by several yards, light-headed and sweating profusely. Although my ankle felt secure and well-bound, I was losing sensation in the lower limb and becoming increasingly lopsided in gait. My boots were sodden and I felt filthy. My skin did not feel my own like the morning after an evening of heady mushroom tea. Ugly, fat insects with odd faces were taking an interest in my breath for some reason, constantly trying to fly into my open and panting mouth and causing me to gag and spit frequently. Do you want me to carry you? I bridled at Brenna's suggestion before noticing her sardonic half-smile. Her eyes were alive with what may have been a combination of wit and pity. I made a rapid calculation. After a formidable catch-as-catch-can match of wits and technique, dignity just barely won out over an 80-20 double team of fatigue and sloth. But win it did. I think I'm doing rather well considering, but I do appreciate the offer nevertheless. Her shoulders and mouth angled to say, suit yourself. She continued onwards. Keep it up then, we'll be there by sundown. Having no real conception of the length of days here thanks to sleeping for the bulk of my last four or five days, I had to console myself that this exchange had at least allowed me to catch my breath and try to massage some little sensation into my calf, if only to introduce the excruciating pins and needles of returning sensation. I'm hungry! I shouted, her impressively broad back. Without slowing, she reached around into her pouch festooned belt and tossed something backwards over her head. I reached up to intercept, and my fingers brushed at a paper-wrapped pastry, making only enough substantial contact that the wrapping fell open to ensure, as it hit the reeds to my left, 
The contents were scattered into individually delicious, greasy morsels that were instantly fallen upon by the ubiquitous and now delighted bugs. I stared at it, wondering for a second if I could compete. I stared back at her, now a further ten paces ahead. I realised that I was pouting. Not a good look for an officer. Finally, the old line and sleepers began to lift from the murk, and footing became easier. We did break eventually and I was able this time to partake of Brainer's comestibles, jealously cupping and guarding them from buzzing intruders. The source of the grease notwithstanding, I was satisfied with my scoffing and during a short break, I was able to grill my saviour a little. She was not a native of this place either, although her path here was more deliberate. She had sought out this baker on the rocks for reasons she was not prepared to share. I pushed her nevertheless. Friend Connolly, you are inquisitive by nature it appears, but not everything is planned. The roads between the spheres mute and shift. Some are tossed upon the currents, others ply them. I have a purpose in this. Her fingers probed at the scars on her scalp, and her eyes looked elsewhere as she ruminated momentarily. Born an envoy of Samanan, now I am cast out and have new grills. Sometimes they align with my old calling, often they do not. I am a traitor to my heritage perhaps, but this new destiny I feel is true. I was baffled by this, and the suggestion that I was at the mercy of some cosmic turbulence. She continued, gazing now at a flickering flame in her palm. Yet, if I am not true to the winged flame, how can I continue to wield it? Unless the Welton Shang is false. A lie. The flame pulsed as if in time with a heartbeat. Hers, perhaps. Then flickered out as she closed her fist. Straightening her back, she looked at me and smiled warmly, if a little awkwardly. I've never said any of this to anyone. Only seconds before, full of barbed and impatient questions, I was disarmed by her rectitude. I considered my response carefully, now feeling a flooding sense of identification and kinship. We are all born to something, an idea, an identification of some sort. We may differ over trifles from our places within it, but the purpose is set, the philosophy is defined. How terrible then when we commit heinous acts in its name, but what choice does one have when one loves and believes in the whole? Her smile dissolved into a grimace. An atrocious act is an atrocity, no matter what law you adhere to by the definitions of your place. A crime. If your beliefs restrict you from seeing that, then you deserve pity on some level. But you may not deserve mercy, although it may be granted. I regret my words. Draw your weapon, she said. Startled, sphincter twitching like a rabbit's nose, I reached for a missing sidearm. Tutting, she threw a short, curved scabbard at me. I scrambled to catch it, this time successfully and I gripped the hilt of a satisfyingly well-balanced blade. Stay low, she hissed. As it dawned on me that she wasn't calling me out, I blusteringly exhaled what had been a desperately contained breath, complete with spittle and a small fart at the other end to balance my equilibrium. I'd never felt so relieved. They say your life flashes before your eyes at a moment of impending doom, but flashes of someone else's, yet still my own, somehow, had flashed before mine bombing at a variety showing leads and roaring at slashed tyres, cradling a disemboweled bear druid of the northern wastes in their final moments with my unfeasibly muscular arms, holding a gate open to a multidimensional box of vivid ochre flames whilst four monkeys capered and mocked me. There were others, but they were definitely the strangest. We're not alone. Draw that blade. I did so. It was a wicked, brutal thing that I'm sure would have breached some kind of safety standards back on my world. It appeared at first to be a compact falchion of sorts, but whilst the cutting edge on the outside of the gentle curve was like a razor, the inner was viciously serrated but shimmering, as if in constant movement. Acid etchings in an unfamiliar script ran the length between the two fullers on the flat of the blade. As I was trying to focus on it, another voice interrupted the moment. There's a price on your head, witch. The navigator wants his map back. Guttural laughter swelled around us. Brainer, upright and defiant, called back. We agreed a price, and I paid it willingly. You were fooled, Brainer. Your offering was tainted. We'll take that map now. The spiked ball dropped from her right hand, 
igniting as it reached the limit of the chain and illuminating the undergrowth ahead of us that had been falling into the dusky gloom as we talked. The luminescent green fat bugs were lighting up around us as the daylight ailed, and I saw one obscured as it passed behind something in the gloom. A misshapen umbra that may have been men. There, I cried. Brainer thundered forward, swinging the flaming weapon around her head in a wide arc that caused the encroaching broom to retreat. I yelled later, and a flaming figure screamed away, attempting to escape Brainer's blazing wrath. It evidently stepped unwisely, and dipped into some murk with a loud hissing of steam and chattering of inconvenient fauna. Around me, I heard the clink and rattle of gear and weapons. Movement encroached on my peripheral vision. I instinctively dropped to one knee, swinging my new blade in that direction more in hope than design. What should have been a glancing blow, and certainly would have been with a Pattern 5 Lee Metford bayonet which was of a similar size, transpired to be an extraordinarily satisfying deep cut as the onrushing assailant's midriff yielded easily to the cutting edge. I knew from the level of resistance to my blow, much like pushing a sturdy table knife through some overly refrigerated butter, that it was cutting deeply and cleanly. The recipient of the wound cursed in a language I could not understand through a mask of finely etched scrimshaw. They gasped then, as their innards spilled out of their stomach and on through their cuirass to slip slowly down their thighs to the wet dirt at their feet, there to steam in the cooling night air and be rapidly pounced upon by triumphant bugs. The unfortunate reached out to grip my shoulder, and their panicked eyes met my own. I eased them to the ground and said a short airman's prayer, very short, as I could hear more movement around me, and more shrieking, and desperate yelling of commands. The ambush was not proceeding according to their plan. Brainer was a dazzling display of motion and light. At least two other antagonists were now ablaze and trying to douse themselves, or beat out the licking and throbbing tendrils of fire encircling their forms. Now, I did not doubt that the pulsing was tied to the fascinating warrior's own heartbeat. Another aggressor was clutching a ruined face and gurgling. For a moment, I felt surplus to requirements, until I spied something circling her in the gloom, illuminated strobe-like, as the spiked ball's arc repeatedly and rapidly achieved its perigree. I was bemused. Three long, multi-jointed legs held a heavy swaying torso above the reeds. This body, similarly with three arms, that each wielded a club, or mace of some description, was hunched forward in a posture of attack, and a leering face peered angrily from beneath a horned carapace. Dangling accoutrements lent the ensemble the appearance of an Australian cocked hat and legs, albeit a more frightening one, with brutal intentions. I charged towards it, or rather, hobbled energetically. Before I could close the distance, it swung two of its three arms towards my companion. One weapon glanced against the whirling ball, interrupting its arc in a shower of embers and slowing its passage, before being catapulted out of the thing's grasp and tumbling away into the murk. The other struck Brainer on the back of her collar, and she stumbled with a grunt. The thing yelled. Infuriated, I closed the distance and severed one of its legs at the height of my chest. Icker squirted. Weirdly, it smelled sweet and quite agreeable. Another yell, but not so triumphant on this occasion. Wobbling uncertainly for a moment on the two remaining stilts, it plunged backwards. Ha! I cried. My mirth was short-lived, as its fall was interrupted by the disarmed upper limb. Stability restored of the other arms, still wielding heavy metal-shod clubs, were now focused upon me. With such a short weapon, my chances of parrying were limited. Instinct took control, and I dodged left and low, stepping inside the limit of their reach from where I could now see that the dangling trappings were something like candied apples, or another fruit. It crossed my mind that if the bog bugs weren't interested in these, then neither was I. And with that thought passed, I gripped the hilt of my strange weapon in both fists and thrust upwards into the torso. A mistake? The benefits of the carved edge were limited by the resistance of the serrations on the inner edge. Or so I thought initially. My opponent was now flailing and trying to score a hit on my back, but the angle of attack made it too awkward. Any blows that caught me were glancing, although bruising and it was now emitting a long, monotone cry of pain. Another shove, and the blade penetrated to the hilt, a low vibration now agitating the entry wound and causing crimson blood 
start to bubble and mist outwards. As I had penetrated the lower shell up to the limit of the blade's length, the creature was now frantically attempting to zero in, and I was acutely aware that my head would not successfully withstand even a light blow from one of those weapons. Sharing its desperation, I began to vigorously saw back and forth. The monotone yell that had not paused for any kind of breath increased steadily in pitch, and I quickly rent my way through the shell. To my surprise, after cutting further through something like feather down and velvet lining, I found no crab-like innards, but rather another set of limbs and a torso in rather well-tailored check breeks and what may have been a waistcoat. I experienced a flinting tinge of regret that I was sawing through those too, but my disappointment at a waste of good tailoring was tempered by the impression that there may have been three legs, and they were seemingly only of half my size. Life fluids were erupting over my hands and making it hard to retain a grip on the blade. The thing had ceased flailing and was now sagging above me. I took my weapon free and withdrew several steps before it collapsed to the ground and the yell, now only a decreasing whine, finally ceased, and then silence. No, heavy breathing behind me. Panicked, I checked on the condition of my companion. Brainer was kneeling, head down, holding the nape of her neck from whence blood seeped through her fingers. Her weapons were still, and the flames exhausted. Bodies lay haphazardly around her, some comparatively sensible looking, others as bafflingly odd as my second victim. I counted seven, most with heads or chests bashed in all smouldering. Compelled by relief and an eruption of previously repressed emotion, I fell to my knees in front of her and hugged her tightly. She stiffened and slowly patted my back with her free hand. It felt odd and awkward, but it was probably the most genuine sensation I'd had since I arrived here. I released her and sheepishly failed to meet her probing stare. Time to leave? She nodded regaining her feet and stretching her neck back until audible clicks and pops prompted a grunt of satisfaction. I hadn't expected them to find me so quickly. If they got ahead of me, it means paths may have shifted again. I nodded encouragingly, but hadn't the faintest idea what this meant for our ETA, wherever. Waving away the bugs that were competing for space around the corpses at our feet, we trudged back towards our previous path. Brainer unfolded and consulted a map. The map desired by this navigator, the cause of this conflict perhaps. It was folded and squared away again and she was striding onward into the murk before I could inquire as to its nature. We'll have to make a diversion, but we will have transport at least. I followed. My leg was throbbing. My socks were damp. I felt sick from the violence. Well, that's something at least. <laughs>